Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Soul Focused Radio. This is your host, Martin Friedman. And again, I'm excited to be joined by Ragiva Madi. Ragiva Madi, how are you, my friend? I'm doing good, Teddy Bear Moses. I'm glad to be on this podcast, glad to be in the land of the living, glad to have people who are listening and us touching people's lives. And we want to thank you for the comments and the feedback you've given thus far with each one of these podcasts, especially the last one. And we we hear what you're saying and we want to keep feeding you. We want to keep feeding your soul. And that's why we have this podcast, why would the Soul Focus Group exist? It exists to feed your soul. And, you know, what I think about when you say that is that, you know, everything we do is because of of everyone that's listening right now and everyone that has connected to us. One of the things I love so much about the Soul Focus Group, my D, is that, you know, we are reliant on the energy of the people that come in contact with us to continue to grow. Now, we are not we are not an organization that is just set and and immovable and unchanging, but we are a live organization that is constantly changing and adapting uh, based on the energy that we receive from all of you. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm, you know, in all honesty, I'm so glad that our organization, our, this entity we call soul focus group is an evolving alive entity. Cause if something is really alive, then you would see people making spiritual adjustments with it. Right. Because if you're learning stuff, then and you're really applying it, that means you have to make some adjustments. And right. most people would rather stay as they are, even though they're supposedly learning something, and not make any adjustments, and not taking it, not take advantage of the opportunities that making those adjustments avail you. Yeah, that's it. That's it, a hundred percent. And I mean, I feel that with our workshops, I feel that with all of our offerings, I feel that with our podcast, ever changing, ever growing, which matches the. The energy and the vibration of the of the universe. So, you know, with that with that sentiment, I would love to jump into our topic today, uh, my D. You know, the last two podcasts that we recorded and released were on the biggest communication problem, and you know, we got such an amazing, amazing response, like really amazing response. You know, it made me really want to continue the conversation with you about the biggest communication problem. And, you know, to hone in a little bit, thinking about the the feedback that I've received from the first two that we released, there was a lot of conversation about relationship. You know, I shared about my relationship with uh, Felicia, who's my wife, which is, you know, of course, a, a love relationship, a romantic relationship, a partner relationship. But a lot of there were a lot of questions came about the way that communication plays out in all the different relationships that we have. Right. So. You know, I would love for us to just kind of jump right in, if you're ready to jump in and talk about active listening in relationships, right? Right. Um, and it, as we jump into that, if you could just talk about again, like uh, like how we define communication and then the role that listening plays in that. I think that's a great place for us to start. Right. Thank you for that. You know, when I'm, I'm listening to people, right, and I know you do a good job of listening to people because I, you know... I had to learn to listen and it was like a learning curve for me. Cause mm-hmm. when we say active listening, it's really an oxy- a oxymoron. Mm-hmm. Cause if you're listening, you're listening. The idea of active listening is foolish in terms of when we think about it. Okay. So you're saying that there's some like extra listening you're doing, you know, mm-hmm. come on. If you're listening, you're listening. If you're not listening, you're not listening. So why put an adjective on it is because we're trying to draw more attention to the importance of listening. And, you know, if you think about it, that means that we have not been socialized to really listen. Now, listening is not the same as hearing because you could hear and not listen. So I guess what they, I'm presuming what, you know, our society put active on it was to get you to understand that it's more than hearing. So you could hear and not listen. So what really is listening? In order to understand what communication is, you, I think you have to really understand what listening is. And, and mm-hmm. later on, I'm going to share a story about what, how I learned to listen from my oldest daughter. She taught me, number one, that I wasn't listening. So mm-hmm. the idea of listening is about tuning into what's being said behind what you're hearing. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say it again. The idea of listening is about tuning into what you hear behind, excuse me, what the sounds or what is meant behind what you hear. So picking up on what a person is not saying. 
because you're in tune. You're so in tune with what they're saying. So and most of us aren't trained to do that, you know, and when you start being trained to do that, you really you you got the key to getting to the key to the vault, because when you really listen to people, you pick up on what's behind what they're saying. You learn that it's hard for anybody to lie to you. See, we are lied to and people end up having, you know, uh, heartaches and everything in relationships because they're not listening. Because but everybody tells you the truth if you listen to what's behind what they're saying. And that's why communication is so important, because communication is like you said earlier, is that communion is the way we bring we bring each other together. But it's also the skill that you uh, bring to the table by you accurately or uncompromisingly representing your five realities. And those five realities, if you listen to the last podcast are your feelings, the first reality, your thoughts, the second reality, third reality is your desires. Fourth reality is the, the, what things mean to you. And the fifth reality is your experiences. No one knows what those things are, but you, you have an intimate relationship with those five realities. And it's therefore your responsibility to communicate those realities to other people. That is on you. You cannot put that on anyone else. So communication right. is how you convey it and how you utilize those realities to get what you want in life, to get what you want from others and have and you be able to give others what they want. That's really what communication is, to satisfy our desires and bring about a, a, a certain degree of intimacy and connection with one another through communication. Right. Yeah. You know, I really appreciate that. And, you know, it kind of gives me an insight probably into why we have to say active listening, too, because, you know, what you just talked about is the responsibility that lies on us as the communicators. Right. As, you know, accurately representing all of those five areas, what we think, what we feel, you know, what we mean, et cetera. So that's the responsibility of us as we communicate, to do that authentically, to do that vulnerably and honestly. I think the the reason why active listening makes some sense to me is because that also puts some responsibility as me on me as a listener, right? So I have to listen from that same place too, instead of, you know, we talk a lot about at Soul Focus Group listening from zero. And I know for me, you know, my D, and I've, I've been talking about this for years, but, you know, I grew up in a house where, you know, listening had a had a sole purpose and the sole purpose of listening was to formulate your argument you know right. like honestly like i i only listened so that i could li- listen for the holes in what that person was saying you know whether it be my parents or my brother or my sister and then later on my friends so i could just you know argue and poke holes in it i i remember hearing a terminology not too long ago where somebody described predatory listening and I was like, mm, that sounds like just listening to me the way I the way I learned it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, uh, we were the listening predator, you know, predators. Like I was I was the lion of listening. Right. Just waiting to pounce on you uh, the minute it was my turn and not even always waiting for it to be my turn. So when well, I think of thing active is, that's listening, not listening, that's really not listening. Well, because- well I understand. But I think yeah. for somebody like me, my D, like somebody like me, I need that terminology. I agree with you. Right. I needed somebody to tell me that in order to listen, I had to be an active participant and in the listening part of it, not in the argument formulating part of it. Do you see what I'm saying? Because right. it, it highlights the, the activeness being in listening, not in the activeness in getting ready to formulate what you're about to say. Right. I, I get what you're saying because, you know, I think, not think, I know for a fact that uh, we are all a voice. We all exist in this world as a voice. And there is nothing that a voice wants more than to be listened to, mm-hmm. not necessarily only heard, but listened to, because we come to know what our power is in life or isn't based upon how well we're listened to. So mm-hmm. children, our children start learning to do it early. They learn whether or not you are listening to them or not. So a parent, we like what well, we multitasking while a kid is saying something to that parent and that parent is hearing them, but not listening to them. And oftentimes we miss out on all the clues that our kids will give us about where they are and what they're, what they're thinking about doing to give us a heads up on, to help them help give them direction. But because we're not listening, as you would say, active listening, we miss out on those clues. So another, another way of saying we, we end up being clueless. You know, you mm. hear parents say, I had no idea my kid was up to that. Well, you wasn't mm. listening, mm. you know, and I, I, I'm not trying to put any parent down because I'm a parent. 
And uh, I've experienced my, I've had my challenges and, and I probably will continue to have challenges. And the reason why I could speak on this is because I had my own pitfall with this whole mm-hmm. conversation about listening, you know, and, uh, you know, yeah, tell us that. Tell us that story. Well, I, I've heard yeah, it. Yes, because I've heard, you know, it, I've heard it quite a few times, but I want I want everybody to know exactly what you're talking about, because this is a powerful, powerful story. Yeah. You know, so, you know, my at that time, my oldest daughter was in high school, her senior year. And, uh, you know, I would pick her up on a daily basis from school. And after school, I had this routine where I, when when I would pick her up from school, she would get in the car. I would then say to her, Naja, how was your day? And she would say, my day was this, that, and the other. And I would shake my head, you know, like a parent would. And that's good, honey. And then almost immediately, I would then get on the phone uh, with maybe a client or, or, or so. And that was my routine. I thought nothing of it. And so this particular day, I had went to, I did a, a presentation to a group of men about fatherhood. And I had a propensity to uh, brag about how good of a father I thought I was because I had I have three daughters and I, I, and I do things with them that I, that I guess maybe the average father doesn't. And I thought, mm, I'm doing a good job. And so on this particular day, when I pick my daughter up, I'm, I'm, I'm really feeling myself. I'm, and to be honest with you, I'm in my ego. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I say to her, Naja, daddy has a question he wants to ask you. And I, before I ask you this question, I want you to be as honest as possible. I won't get upset if you say something I don't like. But daddy really wants to know. Now, scratch this, y'all. I really did not really want to know what she was going to say. I really just wanted to hear her say, Dad, you did a great job. You're a great father. I could not be without where I am without you. OK. Mm-hmm. She says to me, Daddy, I'm so glad you asked me that question because I've been thinking about it for a while. Well, here was the question. I, I forgot to tell you the question. The question was simply, am I a good father? And she proceeded to say, I am so glad you asked me that question because I've been thinking about it for a while. And I was like, what? What do you mean you've been thinking about it for a while? I said, <laughs> never mind. Never mind. Just tell me. Just tell me, am I a good father or not? She pauses for a moment. And she says, Dad, you know, the truth is you're a lousy father. I'm like, whoa, wait, hold up. What What are you What are you saying? My voice raised. You know, I, I got a little uh, disturbed. I had to apologize to her because I promised her that I wasn't going to get upset, whatever her answer was. And I was literally in shock. I'm like, whoa. I was like, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait one minute. Can you tell me one reason or one thing that makes me such a lousy father? Because I thought I was doing a good job. And she says, dad, I'll tell you right off the top of my head. I was like, okay, so what it is? She says, you don't listen to nothing. I'm like, what? I'm a great listener. I listen all the time. She said, you're not listening right now. Hmm. And I'm like, yes, I am. She says, no, you're not. And she said, you know what? She said, I said, said, hold up, hold up, hold up. Because I'm I'm an action person. So I said, can you give me some examples of how you know I don't listen to you? She said, sure, daddy. She said, for years, I've been coming to you, sharing my life with you. And I come back and ask you about it later. And you have no recollection of it. You have no idea what I said to you. And you have no idea how important what I said to you was to me. And she says, you were never able to give me feedback that you really listened to me. I'm like, wow. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting real quiet. I'm so quiet. I'm shrinking. In the, I'm shrinking in my seat now. And she's saying, she says, and she says, I want to tell you three things that I learned as a result of you not listening to me. Number one, she says, I think you really don't love me. I think you're doing what you do because you have to. You're my father. And as my father, it's like a duty to you. But I don't think you really love me. Number two, she says, I hear you tell people all the time how close we are. She says, stop telling people we're close because we're not close. And she says, number three, I hear you telling people how you know me. And you know, she says, you don't know me at all. You don't know me at all. We're not close and you don't love me. Let me tell you, Mm. I was, oh my God. I was like, whoa. Now, at first I was reacting from ego, but then it got me, I came to my senses and I was like, what am I doing? What have I been doing? So I'm traveling around the world, teaching people and, you know, a champion for women's rights and, you know, working to uh, undo and to get rid of racism and et cetera, et cetera, out in the world. And here I am marginalizing the voice of my daughter and probably my daughters at home. So at home, I'm marginalizing the voice of my daughter because I'm not listening. And she was right. I wasn't listening. I had this thing where I was in a hurry to have you listen to me, but I wasn't. And 
listening to people. And I thought in that moment, I was like, I could see the pain on her face. And I could see what message I'd been giving off to her and what idea she was getting about herself, that she wasn't valuable, that she wasn't worth what she's worth. And I'm like, I'm thinking, I'm like, I don't want to lose my daughter. I don't want to lose my relationship with my daughter. The first thing popped in my spirit was to go on a talking diet. Now, y'all, this was one of the, the most difficult things I've ever done in my life. I agreed with her that I would go on a talking diet. And for three years, I went on a talking diet. Now, what does that mean? That means I made an agreement with myself to talk only 20% and listen 80%. So even when I was facilitating workshops with my colleagues, they would tell you, they would ask me to say stuff. I wouldn't say nothing at all. I would only say the parts that I, that I had necessary need to say. The rest of the time I would spend just listening to people, tuning in to what people were saying behind what they were saying. And it transformed my life. What I discovered was I was really losing out on so many wonderful opportunities to get in touch with people, to connect with people, simply because I wasn't listening. Listening again is picking up on what is not being said behind what you hear. And what I learned to pick up on what people were saying behind what I heard, it started giving me a power that I didn't know, I didn't even know was available. I was able to give people what they what they needed immediately, not because I was that brilliant, but because they told me what to give them because I started listening to what was behind what they were saying. My daughter gave me a beautiful gift. And if she wouldn't have been courageous enough to tell me the truth, I wouldn't have gotten it. My coaching practice completely transformed when I learned how to listen. It is one of the most powerful skills you can ever develop in communication. It will help you solve problems that you didn't even know exist because you're picking up on what is behind what's being said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that story. You know, I just want to take a moment. Yeah. I want to take a moment to reflect on that because, you know, I, you know, I've heard the story many, many times because you and I work together so much and, and there's so many times that you share that story and I've heard it and I've, I met Naj. I know Naj now. And, um, you know, I mean, it does take a lot of vulnerability to share that story, right? Ultimately, you know, yes, you definitely turn it into your favor and you turn it into a growth experience. But, you know, even as you tell the story, as many times as I've heard you tell it, there's a lot of pain there, too. Like that had to have been painful, a Extremely painful, painful thing for you to hear initially. Yeah. Right. But because I felt like I was losing my daughter and I felt like, mm -hmm. you know, my ego was really deflated because I thought I was doing a good job. And I found out that I wasn't because mm -hmm. I was making demands on her. But I wasn't making myself available to have her make demands on me. Mm. When you're in the dynamics where you're making demands and the other person in, in the relationship is not able to make demands on you, that's an abusive relationship, regardless of how you try to you know, package it. It's an abusive relationship. And the voice of that person is diminished at, you know, at, you know, at, at, the, at the expense of your voice increasing, their voice decreases because you don't listen. And you, you know, yeah, so you think that, about your children, how much they need, what they need from you. They need everything yeah. from you, you know, and then we don't give, we don't give them access to us. We don't give them the right to, to, op, to, to demonstrate reciprocal accountability in our relationship. Most parents don't. It's what you, what the parents say, or oh, that's it. As if they don't have and autonomy, you, they don't have a voice of their own. Right. And you know, my D you're really making me think of something too, because I would say that the vast majority of us of our generation, you know, you and I are both in our 50s, like the vast majority of, of people in our generation for different reasons, like we never had the opportunity to say that to our parents. Hell right? to the no. I would have like, been slapped. What, 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 what would have happened? What would have happened if you had said that to your parents? Shit, I, I, mean, I heard you dad, say it. slapped across the room. And, right. and there were a lot of things that my dad did that was very questionable about whether or not he was a good dad. Same thing about mom. But I think if right. I would have said that, shit, what? That was unheard of. A, a child having autonomy and being seen as a as a human being. Because yes. as children, we're not seen as human beings, really, not until we become adults. Not until you start demonstrating characteristics of a, as an adult when we really start registering that they have a voice and their voice deserves to be heard. Excuse me, listen to Right. To listen to. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for that distinction. And see, I think that's an important point of the story that we never really talk about. Right. Because you had you had a lot of decisions that you could make in that moment. So when we talk about, you know, listening in relationships, 
Um, you know, we can we can drop the active, you know, because I agree with you. You know, it is redundant. Right. You can't have right. you, passive listening. That is just hearing. Hearing right. is passive it's listening. Hearing. Right. That's, what passive listening that's all here. That's all it is. Right. So I agree with you. You know, that was a, an entree for me. But but, you know, I'm with you 100 percent. Right. So when we talk about, you know, listening in relationships, we when we use that terminology, there's there's decisions that we have to make and we have to make a decision many times that wouldn't be natural in how we were raised or what reflects our childhood experiences or our childhood trauma. So you literally in that story, you literally had to make a choice in that moment because you said you went to ego first and ego first would be like, you know, where you're obviously not going to slap her across the, the room, but you're going to say like, you know, that's bullshit. You know, right. You could have easily yeah, done that. I wasn't going to do that. Easily done that. Right. I wasn't going to yeah. do that, but, but you know, I was really upset. Ego first reaction yeah. is like, how dare yeah. you? All that I've done for you. What are you talking about? I've been taking care of you. I've been feeding you. All that stuff is going through my head when she yep. was saying, yep. you know, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to say it. And, you know, I knew I was like, you know, the voice inside of me said, bro, just shut up, just shut up and really listen. Cause there's yeah. something behind what she's saying that you're not picking up on. And you know what yep. it was? Hmm. I'm in pain. Hmm. You are and, hurting me. Right. You are making me feel less than. You are not reflecting my best, my best back to me as, right. my, as my father. Instead of doing what you what fathers should do, you're not doing that because you're demonstrating to me that my voice doesn't matter at all. Mm. That was painful for me to have to, to really come to grips with what that was what I was doing at home while out on the world preaching empowerment. Mm. And really, you you made the commitment for your front to match your back because you've been out there, like you said, literally that day, right? Yeah, I saw literally that, that day, day putting on the front. Yeah, yeah but, I but, I but I'm saying on. earlier that day, but earlier that day you were putting on the 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 front of what a good father you were. Yeah, right? because I was, I, I, yeah. I didn't know. You believed I, it. I, I know you believed know the it. Though, Martin, even I though know. I've been a life coach all these years, so you could be so convoluted in your relationship with your ego yeah. that you out there performing, you don't even know you're performing until yeah. somebody is courageous enough to call you on, on it. And what, essentially what she was doing was making me aware of the impact of my own power that I wasn't even paying attention to. See, because that's what accountability is for. Accountability, reciprocal accountability is designed to help us become aware of the power we have that we don't know we have. And so when you don't when you have power and you don't know you have it, that means you're abusing it. I was abusing the power of my fatherhood on my daughter and I didn't know I was abusing it because I wasn't even aware of it. So I'm impacting her and I'm landing on her in a way that's really taking away her self-esteem rather than building it. Clearly, that was never your intent. No. But she gave you a gift because she shared with you the impact. Like she knew you loved her. She knew you were, you know, she knew you cared about her on a deep level, right? Right. But but she needed you to know the impact that you were having on her because she knew you didn't know. Let me tell you something. I I remember uh, something that happened after, you know, because we lived together, you know, divorced. So I'm home living just me and my oldest daughter. And uh, so I would travel. Her being 16, sometimes she'd be home by herself. So I travel. And one day I came back, she had cut all the hair off her head. Mm. I was like, oh my God. Oh shit. What are, you, what, are, what are you doing? Why did you do that? And she says to me, she says, daddy, I've just liberated myself. Mm. The whole thing, the whole time she's saying that, I'm thinking her mother is going to kill me. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> I had something to do with that, right? So I'm thinking, damn, I got to get ready for this barrage of you ain't no good and you ain't this and you ain't that. Mm. How could you let our daughter cut all her hair off her head? And she said to me, and and this is when I was on the talking diet and I heard what she said. She says, there had been so much pressure on me to keep my hair a certain way, not just by my mother, but the world. And she says, I want to be liberated. I want to be free to be me. So she cut all the hair off. Mm -hmm. And she went natural and she's been natural ever since. But I had no clue what struggles go on in, in the lives of women around their hair. That was my introduction to, that was a whole new world. I'm like, what? When she sent me down and because I was listening, it's like, 
The conversation she had with me about me being a lousy father prepared me to start listening to her as a young adult in a way that I needed to listen to her so I could be a guide and someone compassionate and caring about her to hear what pains she was in, she was experiencing in her life that before I wasn't tuned into. I was just checking the boxes. You know, you take you take your kids to that and you 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 know you you pay for this and you show up to events, but I wasn't really connecting with her because I wasn't listening to her. Our kids are starving to be listened to. Mm-hmm. And, and we grow up as adults and we become adults and we're still starving to be listened to because our parents didn't listen to us. I don't, I'm not criticizing our parents. I'm saying they were doing the best that they could do with what they knew, right? And what this world focuses on is the value of obedience, right? So your children being obedient is really what you're after, not necessarily listening to them in order to help raise the, the amplify, amplify their voice. We're more after obedience. And so the, the more our kids are obedient, we think we're doing a good job as parents. But what's happening on the inside of children? What's happening? They are sick on the inside. They're suffering on the inside at the expense of them obeying you, even though they know that you're not even you don't even listen to their voice, who they really are. What you're really what you're making me think of too is and you just said it in a way, but most of us are that hurt child that have never really felt heard, right? Exactly. By by our parents or by the world. And so that's how we're interacting with each other in all of our other relationships, our work relationships, our relationships with somebody that we're, you know, meet on the street or driving next to, or, you know, I mean, I'm just thinking of all of the different times that we're in relationship with other human beings And most of us are coming from that hurt child place who has never really, really felt listened to. Exactly. I I can't tell you how many clients I have who weren't listened to by their parents and, you know, created the idea in their head that they had to, like, make good grades in school to get attention. They had to, you know, do, you know, do stuff like that in order to in order to receive a sense of value from their from their parents, because. What they really wanted is just to be listened to, not just heard, but listened to so they can really understand their role in life and, and that, that their appearance in life was wanted. That's how that's how children come to know that they were wanted is how well we listen to them because they are very acute to this. You know, because that listening is like the same thing as tuning a piano. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you able to help your child become more of who they already are by listening to them, not just hearing them. Mm-hmm. So so all that time I wasn't helping to, to guide her, but thank God learning from that, it helped me to be a better parent to my, my other two daughters. So they would listen to at a, another level. So like even when my youngest at five years old came to, came to me and her mother and said, daddy, I don't want to go back to the school. And I was like, what do you mean you don't want to go back to school? I was listening. I heard what she said. What she said was she didn't want to go back to public school, period. She wanted to be homeschooled. Mm-hmm. And then she explained to me why she wanted to be homeschooled. And it made all the sense in the world. She said to us, basically, she wanted to hold on to her childhood. She said, it doesn't take all day to learn what they teach us. She said, if I'm homeschooled. I can learn all that they teach us in three hours and I could go outside and play. That's mm-hmm. what she said. And I'm like, whoa. I was glad I was listening because what she was saying to me and her mother was, I'm a different kind of child. I'm not the same child that everybody else is. And I need you to hear that I have different needs than every other child. I'm a different human being. And every one of our children are different, but we listen to them or we hear them the same as we listen to everybody else, which means we really don't listen to everybody else. And you know, reflecting even on the beginning of this conversation, I think both you and I, you know, have our have our in our different ways and different experiences, we've had to learn to listen. I know I didn't learn to listen. I've, I've talked about this a lot before too. But when I was working as a, a counselor for the Upward Bound program in Seattle, and I pretty much all had students of color, and then we were, I was also working with young people, you know, through youth undoing racism, undoing institutional racism, and you know, the young people I was working with, young kids of color in in both of those settings really taught me that I didn't know how to listen to, you know, Mm -hmm. they taught me that the way I had been taught to listen, as I mentioned earlier, which as you said, my D, it wasn't really listening. 
just waiting to formulate my argument. It's not really listening. But also one of the ways they taught me is just listening to them. They would say things like, you know, I feel you, Mr. Martin, right? Instead of saying, I hear you or I understand what you're saying, they would say, I feel you. And then also they would say, I see you, right? And one of the things that I got from that is that we don't just listen with our ears. And that's why hearing and listening are so different. I literally had to realize that, you know, I hadn't been listening with my whole self. Right. And that we don't listen with just just one sense. No. Uh, all of our no. senses are part of listening. That's right. Because that, that's really what listening is, is a culmination of your you applying your senses to pick up on what people are saying that they're not saying. So right. you can you listen with your eyes, you listen with your feelings, you listen with your desires, you listen with all of your senses, not just one sense. Listening is a very powerful thing because it generates the voice in the room. In other words, it, when you li- really listen to a voice, it amplifies it. The voice gets louder, not not volume wise, but louder and clearer in clarity and expression. You could hear even what people are trying to hide. You can pick up on it when you're listening. So people stand almost naked before you, naked, not nude. They stand transparent before you when you are a listener. As a life coach, I had to develop my listening skills so that people that come to me can't hide. Hmm. Because people try to come to you and hide. And I'm like, hold up. I'm I'm listening to what is behind what you're saying. And that's what I want to deal with. And they're like, did you hear that? Yes, I did. (laughs) Now let's deal with the reality of that, right? And that's how transformation yeah. happens. You pick up on what's behind what people are saying. What, right. you know, and what, what's behind what they're saying is not what they are saying verbally. It's right. what the vibration is telling you that exists behind it. Right. And that's a, that's a huge mistake that we make is that we think, you know, and I tell people this all the time, you know, like it's a little, uh, what do they say? What do the young people say? Cheat code. I'm like, as as white folks dealing with people of color, and I would say, especially women of color and especially black women, I tell them all the time. I tell people all the time, because as you know, and I make no secret of it, I have, you know, a lot of black women in my life right now, very close to me, my, my wife and my, my daughter by marriage. And what I say is the cheat code, the hint is that people aren't listening, you know, to our words. They're, they're picking up our vibrations. And so we think everything's going to be okay because of the words that we say. But at the same time, people that are tuned in, they're they're feeling our vibrations and they're not listening to our words. That's a message that I'm still learning. I'm not sitting here in my D saying that I've achieved something with this. What I'm saying has been revolutionary and evolutionary in my life in terms of understanding that words are just a fraction of what I get across to people. And it's part of the reason why we don't communicate well across races, across genders, across ethnicities and cultures is because we have different ideas and expectations about what communication even is. Right. And it's, it's, it's socialization. Right. You know, we've been socialized to believe, you know, communication is one thing, m- mostly transactional. We don't see it as relational for the most part, especially in the Western world. You know, communication is almost all transactional. Right. But communication by nature is a, a relational thing because as African word Ubuntu captures, I am because you are, mm-hmm. that we are all connected. So it's about getting closer and more intimate to each other so that we can better supply each other with what we need. Because we live in a world where we all need each other. That's that's a no-brainer. So to behave and communicate like we don't, it's like it's really it's madness. You know? Mm-hmm. It is. And it, it feels like it's just feeding the madness right now, too. Yes. Because like in this world right now, bro, nobody's listening. Nobody listens to anybody else anymore. They listen the way that I used to listen or, or, or don't listen the way I used to not listen. It just seems like everybody's only even taking the time to hear someone else or read what somebody says on social media just to formulate the argument, prove that other person wrong. And show how right they are. Right. And you know what you, you know what you, when you, if you start listening, you know what you pick up on? Mm. Pain. Mm. Fear. Mm. Loneliness. Mm-hmm. Emptiness. Loss. And it's disguised by anger, hostility. But what is really behind all of that chatter is I'm so afraid. 
I want somebody to hear me. I want somebody to really pick up on who I am, to see me. No one has ever seen me before. The, the large majority of people exist in this world have never been seen. I'm not talking about your physical body. I'm talking about who you really are. And we thirst to be seen. The kind of seeing that happens to see our, our spirit body is not with the eyes. It's with the ears. It's listened to. When a person is listened to, they are seen. I see you. I see you. And the soul focus group, we see you. Mm-hmm. So you come angry, you come upset, you come mad, you come wanting to argue, and we see you. And we listen to you, and we bring out you. Not your ego, we bring you out. So as you come out, you learn to speak with courage, to be transparent, to be unafraid, to be who you are in the world that's been telling you you're not valuable, you're not important enough, you're not the right color. Not the right size, shape, etc. We see you. We see you. Wow, that was awesome. I hope you all know this, but I love being a part of this podcast because I get to take part in conversations like the one that you just heard. Uh, I think it was an important conversation. And what right given my D said is is a hundred percent true. We do see you. Uh, because we've seen ourselves go through the same thing that you're going through. So I'm not going to keep you. I want you to get ready to to listen to part two as soon as you can. All I'll say is that uh, we do love you. We care about you. We're excited to have you on this journey. Check out everything we're doing at soulfocusgroup.com. Be a part of of the Soul Focus movement. Um, We ask that you stay safe, stay well, and most importantly, stay soul focused.